very interesting. of the boiling water was about 212 degrees Fahrenheit. The water heated by the candle was about 110 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature of my body was about 98, oh, about 0.6 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature of the unheated water next to the test tube was about 76 degrees Fahrenheit and the temperature of the room was about 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Now I've got a question. Why is the temperature of my body, of the boiling water, and of uh, the water under the candle, why is it actually warmer than the temperature of the room? We say it's pretty obvious. The temperature of the boiling water and uh, the boiling water rather and even uh, the water with the candle under it have fire underneath them. In other words, you think it's possible that maybe you have a fire within you? Let's we'll see if we can uh, discover whether this is true or not. If we take this candle that I have here, and if we light it, I got my candle wet. Maybe it's uh, a little difficult. Let me blow the water off. Now, if we place a jar over the top, we may use up some of the material within that of the air because the candle which is a fuel combines with something in the air to produce the flame. Not only did the flame go out, but the water rose from the level of the, of the dish clear up to here. In other words, something in the air was being used up. We could do another experiment to show that something was being used up by taking a test tube. If we took this test tube and dampened the sides of it, pour the water back, and eventually we want to place the little iron filings into our test tube so that the sides are blackened with iron filings and then place it into the beaker of water. Now none of the water rises in the test tube. It doesn't rise because the, the air has not been used up or replaced in any way. But in this test tube, which I started about uh, three or four hours ago, we notice that already some of the air has been used up and the water level is right here. In other words, something in this test tube was being used up. What is that something? Maybe uh, if we looked at the material inside which is getting red in color, it would give us a clue. It's rust. And rust is nothing more than iron oxide. Oxide. 
That sounds like oxygen, doesn't it? Perhaps it's oxygen, then, that's involved in this burning and in the slow oxidation in which the temperature did not change. Let's see, then, if we have burning going on inside us. Let's see how we get our oxygen. I have a model of the human here, parts cut away, and we breathe through our nostrils and through our mouth, down through this tube, which is called the windpipe, or some people would call it a trachea, and into our lungs. But how do we go about getting the air into our lungs? There are two ways. First of all, we have a muscle at the base of our lungs. This muscle is called a diaphragm. Now this diaphragm aids us in breathing. You'll notice that I have a model of the lung here. And at the base, we have a substance which we could call the diaphragm. It's actually made of rubber. And we have two balloons hanging from a glass tube, which would represent our lungs. Now notice what happens when the diaphragm tightens up, or when the muscle contracts. The balloons fill with air. When the diaphragm relaxes, we notice that the balloons collapse. We breathe in, we breathe out. In, out. Contract, relax. There is another way that we breathe, another way that helps us breathe, not another way. And this is by lifting our ribs with our muscles. In other words, I have, we actually lift the rib cage, which makes more space inside of our ribs. Perhaps if we took the tissue away from the ribs, let you see what the ribs look like when we have no air or very little air in our lungs and when we our lungs are full of air you perhaps understand this is the way they look when they do not have air in them now let's inhale can you see them expand exhale and inhale again. Did you see them expand? Well, perhaps you can feel it right on your own body. If you place your hands right at the base of your rib cage, you can feel them right in here. I want you to breathe in very deeply. Feel them rise. Okay? Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Did you feel your ribs, rib cage expand? Now we have found out how air gets into the lungs. Let's see if we can find a way that we can get the oxygen from our lungs into the cells where it can be used. One of the ways is that when we realize that our lungs are made up of many, many tiny little air sacs surrounded by capillaries. Now these air sacs have a membrane which allows some things to pass through it and other things do not. For instance, if we let this marble rep 
represent an oxygen molecule, you'll notice that it can pass from the inside of the lung through these holes, which we will let this block represent the membrane, can pass through the holes and out into the bloodstream. But something as big as a red corpuscle cannot. If we let this object here, which resembles a red corpuscle, you'll notice that it cannot pass through the membrane because it is really too large. The oxygen passes out of the membrane, goes back through the heart. And from the heart, it's pumped out to all of the cells of the body. And eventually, it will enter a cell. Now we've dis discovered that oxygen gets to the cell. But before we can burn something, we have to have something to burn. That something that we burn is food. The oxygen and the food chemically combine in the cell to produce energy. Now there isn't any flame because there isn't any light. But the energy that we get, in this case, will be energy of motion. In other words, energy to move my fingers, energy to move my arm, energy of motion. And we also get energy of heat. You remember at the beginning of the program, I took my temperature and I discovered that it was warmer than the room around me. Then we get two forms of energy, motion and heat, by the chemical combination of oxygen and food. But we get some things which are byproducts. These byproducts could be thought of as wastes since our body may have more than they can use. And they can actually end up poisoning the body. So we can call these things wastes. Perhaps we can, excuse me, discover what these wastes are by looking at what are the foods actually contained. The food, fats, and carbohydrates were nothing more than carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Carbon dioxide is nothing more than carbon and oxygen. Water is nothing more than a combination of hydrogen and oxygen. But what about this thing down here called urea? The urea comes from the breakdown of proteins. Proteins also contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But they contain some other things, such as nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. Now, when the body has used these building blocks, or these simple proteins, to rebuild the cell, eventually it discards some of waste which has these materials in it, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. These materials finally, eventually, become urea, and also salts. Now let's think about how our body could get rid of these wastes. Carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide is taken out of the body by passing off into the, into the lymphatic system. In fact, all of these wastes go through the lymphatic system. And they may pass into the bloodstream directly from the lymph, or they may be carried through lymph ducts, and eventually they get into our body just above or just below our right shoulder where they enter the blood. Carbon dioxide and water 
are eventually leave the cell and go back to the lung. In other words, we let this marble now represent carbon dioxide. It goes back to the heart where it's pumped to the lungs and we breathe out. Now let's compare just for a moment the difference between the air we breathe in and the air we breathe out. Let's look at a, a, a good comparison of these two. For instance, we find that in air we breathe in, 80% of it is nitrogen. But this 80% is unusable. We don't use this nitrogen. We can't. But of, of the air we breathe in, about 20% of it is oxygen. And less than 1% is carbon dioxide. And the air we breathe out, we find that again, about 80% is carbon dioxide. Yeah, excuse me, 80% of it is nitrogen. The 20% that we normally breathe in of oxygen has been reduced by oh, about 4%, so that it's less. But the carbon dioxide has increased from less than 1% to over 4. In other words, we find that the body must be using oxygen in order to produce this carbon dioxide. Also, you might notice that another thing that we produce is water. This water, we can see, it, it comes out of our lungs. Perhaps on a cold day, you can remember uh, breathing uh, quite heavily and you notice people say you can see your breath. Well, you aren't really seeing your breath, but instead you're seeing the water vapor condense in the cold air. So we get rid of some water through our lungs. But what about this urea? What about these nitrogen wastes which are produced by the body? Let's go to this mannequin again. We're going to notice that there is a large organ right located right here underneath the lungs. This large organ is the liver. And it takes down these protein wastes from the cell and turns them into uh, ammonia compounds which eventually develop into urea. If I can take this apart briefly, I'll take the lungs off. I will show you what organ the blood containing these compounds produced by the liver go to. Here they are here. And take this off. You'll notice that there are two objects on either side of the backbone. They're shaped somewhat like a bean. Now, these objects are your kidneys. Your kidneys are located in the center of your back. Now, I know it's rude to turn your back on the audience that you may have. But for this purpose, I want to show you where your kidneys are. If you reach behind you and place your hands so that this part of your finger is right on your belt line, you will notice and place them right beside your backbone. This is where your kidneys are located. Now, what do the kidneys do? I have a model of the kidney here. The blood comes in through the artery and then goes through a series of very fine filters which eventually take out, very selectively take out these wastes, urea, water, and some salts. 
they leave the other parts in the body. This urea passes into an, a tube called a ureter where it goes to the bladder where it's disposed of from the body. The purified blood comes back through the vein and goes out into the body. In other words, we can think of these as filters. In fact, these filters are so small within the kidney that there are over a million of them in one kidney. The last method of excretion that we have, which is actually the process of getting rid of waste, is through the skin. I have a model here of the skin. And the body gets rid of these wastes through the skin by surrounding this little white object here, which is a sweat gland, with capillaries. And it passes off materials into the sweat gland, which rise to the surface, and pour out on your body as sweat or perspiration. The human body of an adult gets rid of approximately one quart of waste in one day. And the materials in this perspiration are mostly water, which aid in cooling your body, some urea, and also some salts. As the water evaporates, the materials begin to decompose. And it's pretty essential that you wash them off so that other people like to be around you because it develops body odor. Now let's review briefly what we have studied today. We have found out that cells take oxygen and food, which is really in a liquid condition at this time, and put it together to produce energy, energy of motion. so that it, you can move muscles, energy of heat. And also, it produces some byproducts, which when they are in excess, are called wastes. Now these wastes are carbon dioxide, water, urea, and some salt. I hope today we've answered the question for you. How does the body get its energy, and how does it get rid of its waste? You have been viewing Science Grade 7, a telecourse presented by the Minneapolis Public Schools. Your teacher today has been Richard F. Rumpy. Subject Area Consultants supervise the planning of each series, which is authorized by the Advisory Committee on Educational Television. Teams of teachers assist in the planning and evaluating of the various lessons presented. Series are produced through the Radio Television Department of the Minneapolis Public Schools. Directed by Louis House.